Okay, well, welcome back to Daytimers week two. Um, good to see uh, last week's crew back and welcome to uh, a few and a few more in person. Um, and welcome Mary online. I, uh, yeah, so, um, and then Hannah also is online, but I don't know if her phone is working. So uh, maybe you'll watch it later, but uh, and welcome if anyone's on Facebook now or later on checking this out. We're in week two of studying Christ in the Old Testament. Week one was was basically an overview with a couple of fun examples. So you can rewatch it certainly on our YouTube page or in the Facebook uh, on the on the Bethesda page, but you don't have to play catch up in order to jump right in today. That's just fine. Uh, we're using a book by Chad Bird called the the Christ Key, under uh, unlocking the centrality of Christ in the Old Testament. Chad Bird is a real wordsmith. We've we've used some of his material in book club and other places. Um, and this is a real Bible study, lots of references, lots of shining examples, and he is a Hebrew and Old Testament scholar by training. Um, so he's our, he's the main guy, and I basically take his highlights and communicate them across and then field questions and certainly um, make it as interactive as you need for your own uh, insights, how this connects to you, or other questions that come up based on it. So because it's being recorded and, sh and shown later, I'm I'm trying to also speak into this camera because it's got a better view of my face. People don't have to learn from a ponytail for an hour. That's not as much fun. Um, and so if you are watching the video after the fact, I, I haven't mastered how to force, let's see, spotlight for everyone. So I think this actually forces the video recording to show the, the screen with my face. It looks good. Oh, yeah, thanks, Barbara. <laughs> uh, all right, so if at any point, Mary or Hannah, if, if there's audio or video issues, just you know, jump in, let me know. Sometimes I don't notice until later on. Occasionally the classroom camera showing everybody here drops out and sometimes it's an easy fix and sometimes it's just gone for the rest of class. And that's just what happens, so. All right, well, let's uh, begin with a word of prayer. Gracious God, we can offer words of prayer because you are the word who has come from the Father, who has given us the Spirit, so that we can study your written word and know that it is also a living word. And help our study as Chad Bird uh, guides us into all, uh, all these incredible appearances and predict, uh, 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 predictions and foretastes of your incarnation happening even in the centuries before. But help us to see you as uh, you, Jesus, as the messenger of the Lord, as the word of the Lord, as the, as the uh, presence of God among your people over the centuries. Be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, chapter two is called Christophanies, which is just a unnecessarily fancy way of saying uh, sightings of Christ, uh, Christ appearances. But the subtitle is even better. This is Walking Backwards to Bethlehem. And this is, a, I think, a really helpful image. So... Uh, to begin with, um, you know, you think about the word orientation, you think about, um, you know, depending on what your goal is, you have to figure out where you are and which way is north. So when we went camping last month with my kids at, at Bethesda Family Camp, at night they like to find the, north, the, the Big Dipper, which is off kind of to the west, sort of around the time that the, the sun is, has already set. And uh, so once they find that, then you can kind of find the North Star and, and Orion's Belt and kind of go from there. Um, you know, during the day, if you can find out where the sun is rising, then you have, you are facing the Orient, which is where Orient and Oriental came from, is the people who come from the rising, the direction of the rising sun, according to the Westerners who were looking east and saying the Orientals live towards the orientation of the sun rising. Um, and, uh, and in Hebrew, there's a really interesting way in which the words for um, for the past and the future are connected to the words for in front of and behind. Now, if I was gonna ask you with American English, um, which word connects to which? So when we talk about the past, do we talk about the past being ahead of us or behind us? Yeah. Behind. behind, yeah. And it's, then if we're talking about the future, is the future behind us or is it in front of us? Uh, someone that's in front of us, is it history re repeats itself? There is that too, yep, yep. So, so in Hebrew, it's actually the opposite. 
in Hebrew, and you know, I know we're not taking vocab tests, but uh, but Chad Bird does give us does give us some vocab here. Uh, the Hebrew word for past is kadem, and the word for past is the same as the word for something behind you. Oh, I'm sorry, in front of you, in front of you. The past is in front of you. And then in Hebrew, the word akarit or akaron means behind you. The future is behind you. Why in the world do these Hebrews have things backwards? I mean, obviously the past is behind us and we're moving to the future. Unless you think with Hebrew eyes. Um, because think about this. Do you know what's going to happen in the future? No. So why would we say the future is in front of us when we can't see it? And we know what happened in the past. So why would we say the past is behind us when we actually saw it and we knew what happened? And so in Hebrew, you, you, you are looking into the past for your orientation um, and you're walking backwards into the future. Looking to the past for your orientation, what you have seen either uh, in your family history or in or what God has done in the past, you are seeing that while you are walking backwards into the unknown blind future. So is that why the culture didn't change? Well, it's why culture always, it was always um, a va high value to carry on tradition, right. respect elders and so forth. Now, my sermon just this last Sunday gave a little hint that we flipped it. You know, Jesus said, you know, welcome children in my name and you welcome me. And, and perhaps in today's world, it would be countercultural instead to place a senior and say, don't forget grandma, don't forget grandpa, like put them at the center and welcome them in my name because we are now so future oriented. Whether that's the hope of a vaccine coming out in record time, whether that's just the uh, future where we think we're gonna, there's going to be better, more peace, more prosperity, better safety, um, we look to the future. And so, you know, if you've been around for a few decades, get with the program, or you know, thank you. But we are learning new things. We don't need to remember the former things. And a lot of people, of course, throw church in that equation, unfortunately. Yeah, but you do. Your past is always haunting you sometimes. Yeah, your past is always haunting you. You live from your past. So there's some sense to that, that yeah, the past sure. follows you as you move yeah. whichever way. <laughs> yeah, and so that's why they call it wisdom. But where does the hope come from? So so for people of faith, the hope comes, it says God has been faithful to our, you know, uh, faith of our fathers, right? That old yeah. God has been faithful. God will not, you know, God will continue to be faithful. But in, the, but in today's world now, it's you, you have your past haunting you, but your hope is not in the past or in the lessons of the past. The hope is we are going to crack the code on yeah. fighting cancer or on figuring out a way to grow, you know, sustainably grow enough food to feed the whole world and distribute it, you know. Uh, so the hope is placed in the future, even if we are haunted by the past. So what, what this chapter is going to do for us, and I think it's going to take two weeks because it was, it's so, there's so much in here. I don't want to rush it. Um, but what this chapter is going to do is say that in the Old Testament, we are walking backwards to Bethlehem. So we're walking backwards, you know, beginning with Genesis chapter one. You have your eyes on Genesis one. You, you, you see and hear what's in there. And then you're walking backwards, now seeing the story of God's people unfolding throughout the Old Testament story until your, 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 your legs bump up against the manger and then you turn around and there's Jesus. Um, and, and the whole Old Testament story has been leading you backwards um, uh, until you bump into Jesus. And the point of that is of course that when we bump into the manger, it's not an obstacle to the path we've been walking, but it is in fact where the, the story has been heading this whole time um, with eyes to God's past actions. And promises now being fulfilled as you um, as you stumble <laughs> over the manger. So that's kind of our our main image for today: walking backwards to Bethlehem, and we're going to see these Christophanies or these Christ appearances in some different categories um, in the Old Testament. And um, there's there's three or four main areas. Uh, the first couple we're going to look at at least today, and then we might have to wait for the rest. The first category we'll do in a minute is the messenger of the Lord or the angel of the Lord, that figure which pops up throughout the Old Testament. Who or what is the angel of the Lord? 
Um, what does that maybe have to do with Jesus? And then, um, and then connected then also is the word of the Lord. Sometimes the word of the Lord comes to a prophet. And so is that only an audible thing that's heard or is there also an appearance or even a, a person or a figure connected to the word of the Lord coming to Isaiah, for example? So messenger of the Lord, word of the Lord. Um, and then I don't think we'll have time today for wisdom. So the wisdom of the Lord or divine wisdom. We actually read some of this on Sunday in the other class, um, Lady Wisdom on the street corner talking about, hey, don't forget about me because calamity's coming and I'm going to mock you. Where were you when I was ready to give you my wisdom? Um, so so we'll, uh, we'll uh, at some point get to the wisdom of the Lord being then also a foretaste of, or not even a foretaste, but Jesus, the Son of God um, at work in the Old Testament as well. And I think there's a fourth one, but it's not, a, you know, it's not on the tip of my tongue right now. So, um, since Al made the joke that it's taken him uh, X amount of years to come to the Bible study here, <laughs> we're going to start on page one of the Bible. <laughs> All right, so that'll work. Unless, unless verse 26 is on the second page for you. So, Genesis chapter one, verse 26. You might still be on page one by this point. Okay. The last verse. <laughs> Then God said, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and on from there. So if we're walking backwards to Bethlehem, the very first, uh, the introduction of humanity is, of course, that we're made in the image of God. We're made in the image of God. And there have been all kinds of interesting scholarly debates about what is the image of God? What does it mean to be made in God's image? Does that mean God has, you know, two arms and two legs and a pair of eyes? Does that mean, does the image of God mean we're rational creatures? And so we have a, a, a kind of a, a self-awareness and a conscience and a, you know, and a brain that is sort of higher than animals. And so God can communicate with us in a special way. Is that what the image of God is? Uh, is the image of God our free will? And so God is, is ultimately free, but God has sort of given or created these creatures who are now free to um, carry out their work in the world as God wishes. Um, there's, there's a few options. Um, but we're about to see one way in which, from the very beginning, um, Jesus, the Son of God, is, uh, is at work. So, now, uh, you could turn all the way to 2 Corinthians 4. And as always, if you, if, you know, if you uh, don't like flipping around the Bible without you know, any um, preview of which ones to look up and put bookmarks in, I apologize. Um, feel free to just listen in because we'll read what we need to hear. So in, in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, uh, Paul talks about how the God of this world, which is a, a reference or a nickname to Satan or to the deceiver, um, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. <clears throat> so here now, Christ is the image of God. And then just a couple verses later, Paul still has clearly Genesis 1 in his mind, because he now, he now recalls, for it is God who said, let light shine out of darkness. Who has now shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God? in the face or image of Jesus Christ. Another place which, um, you know, if you wish, you can turn to Colossians 1. Another place that talks about Jesus as being the image of God. is in Colossians 1, 15 through 17. He... Christ is the image of the invisible God, 
the firstborn of all creation. For in him, all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. So again, here's Christ as the image of God, the firstborn of all creation. Uh, now, here's where Jehovah's Witnesses have their special translation of the Bible. And they'll say, ah, the firstborn of creation. That means Jesus is not um, eternal like the Father. There's only one eternal God, and Jesus can't be anything but a lesser being, because how can he be firstborn and be as old as your father? Um, but... Uh, um, there's a reason why Jehovah's Witnesses remain a small sliver in the big wide world of uh, people who study the scriptures and profess faith in the God of the scriptures. The first born, um, you know, first born in the image of God. And the, yeah, and the yes, and so the word that, that you find in our creed, in the Nicene Creed, and then in all the related debates, is the word begotten, not made. So he is, he is uh, begotten, not made of one being with the Father, is how the Nicene Creed goes. And so the idea is that, and this is not a class in the Trinity, so don't lose me. <laughs> uh, the, the idea being that Father, Son, and Spirit live in this co-equal divine relationship, this, this society, this um, one in three. Um, and one of the ways that, it, that the relationship in the Trinity is described is the Father begets the Son. The, 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 the Son is eternally begotten of the Father. That The Son has always been the Son because he's always been the Son of the Father. But also, the Father has only always been the Father because he's always been begetting the Son. So that it's co-eternal. And then the Spirit is a part of that as well. Um, the point here is that, that Christ was the, uh, the, the firstborn, or the, the, um, the, that means the inheritor, the, the, the one, you know, the, the, the life the Father has begotten. Um, and, uh, and being God and being eternally begotten then, um, Jesus' image is spit an image of the father and jesus's authority is god god is, jesus is divine jesus is uh, firstborn meaning he inherits everything that is the father's not meaning there was a time when he was not it means he is eternally uh, the inheritor of all things now let's connect genesis 1 to colossians 1 let's start connecting some dots so you we see well what's the point of this that when genesis 1 says in the you know let us make man in our image and then when it goes on to say and so god created them in the image of god he created them um, it is not just that we have to figure out okay you know what does image mean is it looking like god is it our free will is it our reasonable mind no it is in jesus in christ god made them male and female he made them because colossians 1 not only says that jesus is the image of god but it says in him and through him and for him were all things made so that even in Genesis 1.27, the creation of humanity in the image of God is, is quite literally the creation of humanity in Christ. For we have been created in Christ Jesus uh, from the very beginning. And that's a beautiful thing, too, because, of course, we have a redemption on the cross at a moment in history. Um, but we also have here from the very beginning, this is who God is. God is the one who creates, uh, who has created us in Christ, in his son. We have always been in Christ as creatures of God. We have always been, in that sense, children of God. Now, the problem thereafter and the reason for a, a cross and a redemption is that we, we didn't like being children of God. We wanted to rebel and go our own way. But in creation, God has created us in Christ from the very beginning um, so that the image of God is not trying to figure out if God is like part male, part female, is God, you know, like a man? What is it? It is God has from the very beginning created us in the, in His Son um, to inherit to inherit all things that belong to His Son, to be a part of the divine life, to be caught up in God's life. Is um, that in body, or is that in think or thought? Uh, what do you mean? Say more about that. Well, by Christ, but Christ was a man, so. 
Right. We're not all males. And so it might be in the body of Christ in Christ. Yeah, that's good. So um, uh, if you had, if you didn't hear um, Jack, the microphones are good, but just in case, the question is, well, Jesus was a male. Um, he was a circumcised male. So how does that fit when not everybody, not all humans are circumcised males or circumcised males? So in fact, the connection from Genesis 1 and Colossians 1 helps to spell that issue because um, uh, being, being in Christ doesn't mean being in uh, male, male bodies. It actually means being male and female, that, that, that women are not secondary, secondary um, second-class citizens in the kingdom of God, as if Christ was a man, he had to be a man, he saved men, and then women sort of get in on this men's club uh, secondarily. But that the fact that we were created in Christ, not as men, but created in Christ, male and female, he made them. Um, th that actually reminds us, stop looking under the, the skirt to find out what it means to be made in the image of God, but start looking. You said thought. It, it, something along those lines, that to be in Christ is not to have the right appendage, but to have to be in him, to, to be connected to him. Spiritually, however that, you know, however that phrase might, might Could that be out. our souls, no matter yeah, what our yeah. bodies are? Yeah, yeah, and, and souls, you know, for, for the Bible, the soul really captures all of us. It's not just, it, it's our body, it's our mind, it's our spirit. Soul is the biggest description of a person. Um, What's the definition of the soul? So in Hebrew, soul is nephesh. It's the same word for neck. Most Hebrew words are also a word for something else because it's very visual. So a nephesh is what connects your body, you know, your, your, your head and your heart, your mind and your body. And so the soul is the, it's the connecting point. It's that which makes you a spiritual and physical being. Um, we have misunderstood it to say, to think that soul means that invisible part of you that has always been eternal. And as soon as you die, like the soul can just kind of whiz around until God sends it up or down. Like, no, a soul is a, so we are, you could say this way, we are embodied souls or yeah. and soul bodies. Well, what I'm getting at is uh, we have a lot of good people have souls. A lot of bad people have, have a soul. Uh -huh. Yeah, everybody so in this sense. The word has a, yeah, everybody has a soul. Two edged meaning. I mean, uh, the way you think about it, this guy, uh -huh. this guy must have had a real epiphany right in this book. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he, I think he had fun with this. Yeah. Okay, so when, when, when the image is now Christ and we are created in Christ from the very beginning, um, uh, now we also see that, that the image of God would restore the broken image of God. So when, the, when, when male and female and, and Adam and Eve and, and everybody since has broken the image of God in ourselves, um, when the icon is cracked, um, we have already been shown from very from chapter one. We've been shown that God's image is going to restore God's image in us. Um, that from the very beginning, um, being created in Christ means um, we are in the one who will redeem us. We are in the one who will not stand for this image to be to remain cracked, broken, and um, and, and cut off from God. So here's an image. Um, Athanasius was a, uh, he was the, the main theological adversary to Arius, who uh, Arianism was one of the major heresies early on. And Arian um, uh, picked up his guitar and, and created summer camps and the kids would go out to summer camp and he'd say, they would sing, there was a time when Christ was not, there was a time when Christ was not. I don't know the tune, but those were the words. And Arius said, Jesus is not eternal. He's not equal to the Father. There's only one person uh, of, of God. And so Athanasius was the, was the main um, opponent in that. And Athanasius won. Uh, you might recall, it has, it's been years at Bethesda, but have you ever recited the Athanasius Creed in worship, perhaps on Trinity Sunday? Um, it's been years if it has been. I don't remember it ever being recited here, but we have three creeds, three main creeds that we subscribe to as, as Lutheran Christians. Is that, is that that really long, long one? 
really long. So the, the Apostles' <laughs> Creed, we almost always do. Nicene Creed, we occasionally do on big, you know, big days. But the uh, Athanasius is yeah. far yeah. longer. That yeah. It. yeah. And it gets, I mean, it's basically a, a creed about the Trinity for paragraphs. And then it has a bunch of condemnations at the end. Um, so uh, anyway, that's Athanasius. And um, here's the image he gets. Um, you have a painting, you have a portrait painting, and, and the painting is old, it's the paint is faded, it, the canvas is cracked. I mean, you, can, you can't recognize, who is this a painting of? What is this? And so how do you restore this? Well, you're not going to, you know, hey, painting, you know, get out of the sunlight and heal yourself, you know, restore, you know repaint yourself. That's not going to happen. So what, do you, what does the painter do? The painter goes and finds the original um, model for the portrait and sits them back down again and says, okay, there's my model. Here's my broken canvas. Now I can repaint the same image because I'm, I'm looking at I'm looking at it. And so when the Father, uh, when God, generally speaking, sees broken the broken image of God, humanity, broken in sin, um, he doesn't say, well, clean yourself up, get your paint set out, and try your best. He, he sends his son. And in seeing the son on the cross, uh, and, et, et, et cetera, in seeing the son, the Father now restores the image to all humanity through the son. That's... That's Athanasius' picture. Yeah. Okay. Chad Bird says, the main point is this. The creation of humanity is a prophecy of the incarnation. He who would become human as he is forming Adam and Eve looks over at us, smiles, and gives us a wink. The day will come, he suggests, when I become one of you. Already in the opening chapter of the scriptures, therefore, as we begin walking backward to Bethlehem, the past is pregnant with the future. There will be another Adam. There will be a re-Genesis. We are barely 26 verses into the Bible before it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. <laughs> that's very fast. So that's the conclusion to the, um, the image category, the image of God. Um, we are made in the image of God, but don't forget we are made in Christ, who is the image of God and has come to has come to restore that image. So our next one is the messenger of the Lord. This one, I think, uh, I think you'll, you'll find um, a lot of puzzle pieces coming into place sometimes. Um, because as you as you go through some of the most significant, memorable Old Testament stories, you find that either the angel of the Lord went to someone or the messenger came and appeared to someone, and things happen. And, um, and, and, but then as you, if you really study closely, you try to figure out, is this an angel or a human messenger, or is this God? Because it's also like referring to itself as God. Like, which is it? And, and that confusion, we're going to see um, some signs that that confusion actually resolves itself once we have Christ on the scene. And we realize the angel of the Lord is the messenger of the Lord. It is Jesus in the Old Testament coming to his people um, in various ways. So let's, uh, let's get into this, add a little bit. First thing is, the word for angel is malak, M-A-L-A-K, malak, or malak. Um, the meaning is not what we think of as angel. That is a supernatural, not human, but maybe looks humanish, uh, but some kind of supernatural figure. Um, the word malak, primarily means a messenger. And so, I mean, I could, you know, we could send one, of, you know, we could send each other as Molochs to uh, deliver a message. Um, he uses the, the, the Spanish word senora to say, if you translated senora as mother, you would sometimes be correct, and but a lot of times you'd be inaccurately translating it. Because although every mother is also a senora, not all senoras are mothers. Uh, not all women are mothers, and not all senoras are mothers. And so when, we ch when, when a lot of our English Bibles translate Malak Yahweh or Malak Adonai as angel of the Lord, well, not all messengers are angels. And, 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 and so we already kind of lead the witness the wrong direction sometimes. How do we know that? 
We know that because we know the word malach also means messenger. I mean angel. What do you mean? Uh, to all angels or what? So what I'm saying is the, the word that gets translated angel in the stories we're about to see it, um, is a word that means more than angel. It, it doesn't just have to mean angel. It can actually, it, it, it's more general meaning as a messenger, right? Um, uh, so, you know, if I, if God sent a senora to go talk to Moses and Moses said, a mother has come to talk to me. Well, he might be right, but he might also be wrong. It might not be a mother. It might be a senora who's not a mother. And so when an angel of the Lord comes and talks to Moses, he might say, an angel, and he might be right, but he might not be right. It might actually be a messenger of the Lord who is in fact the Lord himself. So messenger is the big word. All images we see are uh, the angelic uh, like face, no beard, no whiskers. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I have um, a class I want to teach sometime down the road, which I think would be fun. Maybe even for a Sunday class to try and attract some people. Is a class on angels and demons. Mm -hmm. What in the world are these things? Uh, and what does the Bible actually say? Because does the Bible say that angels have wings? Does the Bible say angels can fly? I mean, like, what, you know, what is pop culture and what is biblical? Anyway, that's another thing. You know, some people call will call you, oh, you're just an angel. Well, oh, yeah. you're not flying around, but, you know. You, well, and, it's, you. and yeah. it's very common to refer to our, our, our loved ones who have died yeah. as angels, especially when children die. Oh, yeah. Um, that, that they're an angel now or they perceive their wings or my angels in heaven. And that is not an accurate thing to say. But it's also not something that Pastor Tom corrects people who are grieving and says, yeah. oh, your kid's not an angel. Yeah. <laughs> that's not what you do. Um, yeah. um, so that's, that consoles them, I guess that's okay. The, 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 yeah, the point is, yeah. my child is with, is with the Lord now. Yeah. Yeah. We're like, song song, I'll fly away. Yeah, there's another, yeah, there's another thing to bookmark for a future. Um, so let's go to Exodus chapter three. Exodus three. So you might have a signal going off, but this has got to be the beginning of Moses' story. Because uh, we're very early in Exodus. In fact, you would be right if the burning bush popped in your mind. We're going to just focus on the first six verses of Exodus chapter three. So this is after Moses has fleed to Midian, to the wilderness. He's left Egypt um, because although he was very passionate for the, uh, to, to rectify the unjust treatment of a Hebrew slave, he did so by killing the Egyptian who was mistreating the slave. He was spotted and he ran, to, he ran for his life so that he would not be killed for murder. So Moses, the murderer, flees to the wilderness. He's already not the greatest candidate for a biblical hero. Um, if we were, um, if we were uh, looking for uh, someone to hire, but this is not how the Lord works, of course. He tries to find the worst case scenario so that only the Lord could have done it. Um, so Moses, by this point, uh, he has uh, he's settled out there, and he's a shepherd now. He has, he's married to a foreign woman. And uh, uh, that means also religiously foreign. So that's all part of the equation. And now in chapter three, Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. It's not a priest of Yahweh, but it's a priest of whatever tribe, tribal gods they have. Moses led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord, or there the Malach of the Lord, the messenger of the Lord, appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, 
for he was afraid to look at God. Okay. So you can already see like some complicating details. We have in English, we have an angel of the Lord, but to a Hebrew, they would at least have a messenger from God, but that could be a prophet, it could be a human. Uh, so we have an angel or a messenger, but then, but then he is afraid to look at God when he looks at this figure in the bush. Um, and then, of course, what calls to him out of the bush is not angel or prophet or messenger. It is God called to him out of the bush. Um, and not just any God, but uh, this is the God who I am the God of your father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, I'm not a new God, and, and, and I'm, I'm the one that uh, you had not seen before, but you have worshipped me and, and heard of me um, because of your, your forefathers. So it's already kind of complicated. Like, what exactly is this figure? Um, you know, in, in, in this scenario, he's, you know, both got, uh, whoever this figure is in the bush, it's both visible and audible. You know, a lot of Sunday school pictures, you might have a bush with a flame in it, like a burning bush. So we just draw a picture of a burning bush. Sometimes you'll see like a figure of like an angel inside of the flame with the bush. Um, so, so sometimes it at least catches that there is some figure that, that Moses sees. Early sign of propane. <laughs> An early sign of propane. The gas, the, the gas of God, the glory of God is, is uh, propane. Yeah. Um, this is, um, so just to say it up front, and then we'll get into more detail. This is the son of God making a personal appearance to call his spokesperson Moses. This is the son of God. Now he hasn't been given the name Jesus yet because he hasn't been incarnated in, 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 and united with human flesh and, and the child, the Christ child. But this is the divine, eternally begotten son of the father um, uh, who is uh, making a personal appearance, a pre-incarnate uh, Christophany or appearance. Um, he appears here to Moses as the messenger of, of Yahweh. Um, but you can also find him elsewhere. You can find him um, uh, as Yahweh in his temple in Isaiah's call in Isaiah 6. Uh, you can find him appearing to Jeremiah as the word of the Lord, the word of Yahweh in Jeremiah 1. You can see him appearing to Ezekiel as the glory of the Lord in human form in Ezekiel chapter 1. And in all these scenarios, Jesus, well, who we would call Jesus, but the Son of God is the visible and audible deity. But each of them reveals a different facet of his identity. Word, messenger, glory, um, human form, all these kinds of things. Uh, you can almost see a delight in Jesus um, kind of, uh, well, earlier Chad Bird used the word um, smiling and giving us a wink. But you can almost see like these little Jesus showing up and like, I'm coming. You know, here's a little hint. Uh, uh, I'm more than a messenger. I'm more than an angel. Um, and God is more than an invisible also, God is more than an invisible being, but God is also um, will put himself in ways that we can see him and not be <laughs> burnt to a crisp. <laughs> yeah. Personal appearances. Okay. Later on, and we're not going to um, turn to it, but it's, it's Exodus 23. Um, maybe we could just like Exodus 23. Now, Moses is he's got the people of Israel at the foot of the mountain, and he is now up on the mountain. He's received the Ten Commandments, uh, and he's begun to receive a lot of the other laws. And, and he, uh, in 23, verse 20, 23, verse 20. Um, this uh, this word of this yeah. word of God on Mount Sinai says, "I'm going to send an angel, or I'm going to send a messenger in front of you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place I have prepared. Be attentive to him and listen to his voice. Uh, do not rebel against him, for he will not forgive your transgression, for my name is in him." Mm -hmm. This is uh, Exodus twenty three twenty and twenty one, and then twenty two also. If you listen attentively to his voice and do all that I, that I say, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and a foe to your foes. 
So uh, on the one hand, he's referring back to that angel of the Lord figure from the burning bush. You know, uh, hey, Moses, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you an angel, an angel of the Lord. Um, there's similar things when this, when this angel, again, read messenger, when this messenger um, speaks, he actually speaks with God's voice. Um, uh, listen to, when you listen to his voice and do all that I say, um, also this, this messenger of the Lord not only speaks uh, as God and with God's voice, but this messenger of the Lord will not pardon your sins for my name is in him. Now that sounds like, not like Jesus, right? Like Jesus is the one who comes to save us from our sins. What's this angel of the Lord who's not going to, well, it's just the converse of that truth. That this angel of the Lord, messenger of the Lord, who speaks for the Lord, has the power of forgiveness in them. They, they, they hold the power of absolution. And so here the warning is, if you don't, you know, if you don't listen to them, this one will not forgive you. But the converse will then also be true. This one speaks with my voice, has the power to forgive or not forgive, has the power of absolution. And not only that, my, because my name is in him. And so then you, can, then you can start to search the New Testament about the ways that Jesus not only is somehow connected to the Father and what's going on with Father, Son, Spirit, but you can also begin to see ways that the New Testament church is talking about the name of the Lord and how... Um, for example, when we baptize people, Jesus didn't teach us to baptize in the names of the Father and the Son and the Spirit, but to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Spirit. And so um, to, to, to have God's name put in this messenger makes this messenger far more than any other prophet or messenger or angel or human. This messenger is speaking as God because this messenger is God, the Son of God. Among, uh, among the people. And now you can imagine that all the more uh, incredible that when Jesus is on the Mount of Transfiguration and Moses appears with him on the mountain and, and Luke tells us the added detail that on, while being transfigured, Jesus was speaking with Moses and Elijah about his coming exodus. And the command from the cloud on the Transfiguration Mountain to the disciples, the command is, you know, this is my son whom I love, with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Well, that, again, here's another huge echo to, to Moses is standing on Mount Sinai in Exodus 23, and God says, I'm going to send my messenger to you. Listen to him. He speaks with my voice. Forgiveness is in his hands, and, uh, and my name is in him. Um, and this all becomes... You know, Peter, James, and John get their own Mount Sinai experience. It's a different mountain, same idea, um, as they are told to listen to this Jesus before them. He's messenger of the Lord, whose name is in him. So more than an angel here, not only here in the burning bush, but here in Exodus 23, uh, 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 more than an angel is promised to lead um, God's people through the wilderness uh, and and. You know, be the be the flame uh, of the pillar of flame and the cloud by day and by night, and so forth. Now, many the Jews were confused. Well, it's you know, it's really it's if they have all the language, uh, but the, you need the Christ key, the name of this class. They don't. When, once you have the key, you're like, oh my goodness, everything falls into place now. They didn't have. They didn't have the key. Um, Yeah, let me see if there's anything else I want to throw in on this topic of Exodus before we I think it's easier come, for us come to down to the finish line. Easier for us to recognize this and see this and understand it than it was for Jews at that time. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Because there are a lot of false prophets, too. Yeah. Well, and that's why Jesus has to pray, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. <laughs> um, and then even Peter, in his, one of his first sermons in Acts, he's like, they didn't know that they were crucifying the Lord of life. You know, they would not have crucified the Lord of life. Now, um, who knows? That might not, you know, they might have done it anyway. Uh, they didn't like, they didn't like how God appeared to them. So anyway, that meaning us, uh, of course. Um, yeah, my name is in him. My name is in him. That's Moses being told about this messenger to come in Exodus 23. 
Uh, Chad Bird says, uh, in the Hebrew mind, names are not mere designations by which we tag someone. They are synonymous with the person. Names convey the isness of a person, their whole identity. Yahweh is saying, who I am is in him. To see him is to see me. To hear him is to hear me. To follow him is to follow me. Uh, you know, this begins to sound a lot like the Gospel of John, especially. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Um, just to briefly give you some examples, we won't turn to them because I don't want to, you know, get too scattered here. But other examples of the messenger of the Lord, which is often translated the angel of the Lord, coming to people in the Old Testament in some beautiful ways. The first instance of the angel of the Lord is Hagar in the desert fleeing from Sarai. Um, when she's had, I mean, she flees, and then later she has to flee with Ishmael, the, her child. Um, and it's the angel of the Lord um, meets her, and it's Genesis 16. You can look at it, you know, on your own uh, sometime. But in Genesis 16, he, he not only um, meets her, but then he promises her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. Uh, he says, I will do this. So again, here's the if it's an angel, but the angel's saying, I will do this. So there's more than an angel going on here. So, I mean, just imagine the son of God, you know, pre-incarnate, right? Uh, the, the son of God coming to this single mother in the wilderness and saying, you're going to have not only this kid live, but thousands of kids will come after him uh, through your family. Uh, you know, and she actually becomes the first person who gives God a name in the Bible. She calls him uh, uh, the Lord who sees, uh, El Roy, a God of seeing. Uh, and not only that, not only is it because this is the God who sees, but she also says in uh, Genesis 16, 13, she says, truly here I have seen him who looks after me. Kind of like what the, our Indian tribes called, gave names to their own people. Mm -hmm. uh, one who sees, one who knows, one can drink, mm -hmm. one can swim, or whatever it is, named after what they do or look like. Or, right. Or yeah. Embodiment of. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That a name becomes an embodiment of who you are. What is like, you know, when you think of this person, they are like when Andrew and I uh, were hiking around Mount Shasta uh, on our first road trip together, we had come across this Native American in the mountains and and his name was All Hearts One Song. Oh. Um, that was his name. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and that says a lot about him <laughs> yeah. um, from that name. Yep. That's kind of why a lot of pastors try to name their kids something from the Bible. And you have to, you have to try to figure out, like, oh, why do I want to name my kid this name? That's kind of why I do it. Because I, I, I like, I really love that names mean more than just, hey, you. <laughs> um, there's, a, there's a kid in this church named Chase. And his mother told me, don't ever name your kid after a verb. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that was, uh, that was one brief example was you could go to Hagar and Hagar's story and find the angel of the Lord, i.e. Uh, pre-incarnate son of God coming and caring for this woman. Uh, she sees God because she sees this messenger of the Lord. You can also see... Uh, the angel of the Lord wrestles with Jacob all night. Yeah. Um, Where's that at? Uh, Genesis. Genesis 32. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so again, with these, these pre-incarnate figure uh, appearances of Jesus aren't simply, they're not always like uh, non-physical, ghostly, ah, it kind of looks like a burning bush figure, but that um, Jesus could actually take human form, wrestle with Jacob all night, and then say, okay, that's good, but that's not my, I'm not uniting myself with humanity permanently uh, just yet. But it's the angel of the Lord wrestling with Jacob. And again, if you, if you read, read that, that account, you would also see that it's hard to figure out, is he wrestling with God? Or, you know, because at the end, he doesn't say, I've wrestled with an angel all night. You know, he, he says, I've wrestled with the Lord. <laughs> um, uh, he also appears in Joshua 5, 13 to 15 as the general of the celestial armies, the angel of the Lord um, is the general of the celestial armies, which, um, you know, can also be a, a, have a little bit of a foretaste of the end of the book of Revelation, like Revelation 20, 
when uh, the, the, uh, Christ returns um, with, with an army of martyrs um, who, who come not robed in military gear, but come robed in, in robes dipped in the blood of the lamb um, with no weapons whatsoever. The only weapon is the word, the sword, which is a word from, from the son of man's mouth. Uh, but here in Joshua 5, he's a general of celestial armies. He appears in Genesis 18, the angel of the Lord, along with two other uh, figures, comes to visit Abraham. And that's when Abraham and Sarah is laughing about the promise of a son. And Abraham feeds, feeds uh, you know, uh, uh, meets with these, these figures. And then later on, um, one figure goes back to heaven and two and the other two go to Sodom. And they're the ones that are with um, uh, the guy, Lot. <laughs> they're with Lot. And the people of the city want those angels to come out so they can have their way with them. Um, but the third figure of that group of three is not there. And so this, again, you'd have the son of God and two other figures with Abraham. But the son of God doesn't go to Sodom. He's back, you know, in, 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 you know, in heaven, so to speak. You know, like he's somewhere else. He's not in, he's not, he doesn't stay with the other two who go down to Sodom. Yeah, those are the ones. That's it. Um, so then where we'll go next week is we'll, we'll go now to when the word of the Lord appears to someone. The word of the Lord. And, and at first, it sounds like the word of the Lord is just a, I hear something. God, is that your voice? But in fact, you begin to say there's also vision and sometimes figures, but, but there's something more than just uh, I hear something. Uh, uh, but actually, um, somebody comes before these various prophets. We'll see this with like um, Samuel. You know, uh, you know when uh, Samuel and Eli, young Samuel's in the temple, you know, and, and he hears his voice at night. Okay, so, so we'll do the word of the Lord next week um, and then the wisdom of the Lord. And so both word and wisdom, just like messenger and image, these four categories become ways that Jesus was was uh, flirting with the incarnation and leading his people from the beginning. Um, he wasn't just twiddling his thumbs in heaven for centuries. Uh, Jack, you had a question? I don't want to talk about the vision. Well, <clears throat> anybody can have a vision. If you think about something, you'll see it in your, in your mind. Mm -hmm. Is that a vision? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But in, in real years, or, uh, Proposed real years. What, what's the time frame from Exodus to coming Christ? It's like uh, two thousand years, like very roughly, yeah. eighteen hundred to two thousand years. Yeah, yeah. You have. Well, I don't have the Bible with me that has the timeline in the margin. That's the that's the question. But yeah, wow, a long time. It's a while. Yeah. Yeah, and, and Israel, and they have judges for a few centuries, and then you get um, you get Saul and David around 1100 to 1000 BC, and then by by 700 the Northern Kingdom's gone, and by five six fifth sixth century BC the Southern Kingdom's defeated and next and it's, uh, uh, it just goes from there. But yeah, all right. Okay, thank you. Here we go. You're welcome. Have a good week. See you. See you on Thanks, Sunday. Thanks, Pastor Tom. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Hannah and Mary. Glad you could hear it, Hannah. I thought that worked out. Yeah, I heard you. I just can't figure out turning my face off. Okay. So I put you down, Tom. Thank you. All right. Thanks to whoever's watching this later or on Facebook. God bless. Yeah. Bye. Bye.